Hello everyone and welcome back to America Literature Summer Course 2020. This is class number 14. We will continue uh, the Mark Twain business and we'll continue discussing uh, Huckleberry Finn, his masterpiece. Uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, Jim and this is uh, Huckleberry Finn on the raft on the Mississippi River. <coughs> um, today we are going to talk, we've, we've mentioned the main characters, but we, will, we are going to tap into them, touch on them uh, quickly, but we will cover chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four today. The first chapter is about civilizing Huck, the second one, the boys cave, Jim, and then a good going over and the slow but sure. Civilizing Huck. <coughs> now, one main theme in Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn is that he wants to explore this cognitive dissonance of the American public culture. Cognitive dissonance here is to say something and to do something else, which is a manifestation of hypocrisy, of social hypocrisy, where people order their kids to, will, to be well-behaved and they themselves do not behave. Where people believe in something and do something else, where, th where they say something and do something else, or believe in something else. And this is all because of the collective consciousness that impose on them doing all these contradictory things, okay? And here, the term of civilizing Huck. Huckleberry Finn is a boy, uh, is a wild boy. He, he has no mother, he, his father is drunkard all the time, his father is chasing him for money. It's a, 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 an extremely deconstructed scene here, okay? Where the boy is lost, but he is kind-hearted, he is cunning, he in, he's innocent as well. Uh, and he is disobedient. And this disobedience derives from the uh, way he was uh, upbrought by his daddy. Okay, we'll come to this later. <coughs> Listen here, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn continues the story of Tom Sawyer. And Huckleberry Finn where the adventures of Tom Sawyer leaves off. Huckleberry Finn starts where Huck Tom Sawyer closes. Huck Finn implies that the difficulty for the reader to distinguish truth from fiction may possibly be continued in the sequel as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer was made by Mr. Mark Twain and he told the truth. Mainly there was things which he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. Stretched? يعني ما بطل حكي فيها لون الكلام, okay? So, Mark Twain Zuckerberg Finn is a, a portrayal of real life without makeup. He intended not to leave any detail without being naked in the eyes of the beholder. As a reminder, the main characters are Jim, the escape he or the escaped slave, Huckleberry Finn, of course, and Widow Douglas, who adopted Huckleberry Finn, and Tom Sawyer is Huckleberry Finn's best friend and his idol, and Pab, the father, you can see from the picture that his father is devilish, okay? Chapter one, at first, they attempt to play a trick. They refers to the boys on the lovable and gullible gem. They are with him and they want to play a trick with him. They are boys. They like playing, like being naughty, okay? 
<coughs> and Jim is Miss Watson's slave. By slipping Jim's hat off his head and hanging it on a tree and then convincing him that witches were making noises. Yeah, they wanted because, remember, this is an example of how Huckleberry Finn believes in superstition, so does Jim. Mythologies, fable stories, yeah. Um, in chapter two, Jim said the witches bewitched him and put him in a trance. In a trance, they made him sleep. He like sleep-like person, okay? And rode him all over the state. Yeah, it's like a dream. After a brief discussion of how Jim became conceited after regaling the other slaves with his bravado for confronting the devil, Tom and Huck meet with some other adventurous companions, including Joe Harbour and Ben Roger. Now, the boys make a pledge to form a band. Yeah, the idea of being a gang who do whatever they please, they snatch things from here, snatch things from here, there, um, throw stones on other houses, do all sorts of naughty things that kids do or boys do, okay? Tom Sawyer's gang is the name of this band or this gang. <coughs> and they have to pledge to write their name in blood. They wound themselves and as if it's like a blood leak, okay, a blood connection in order to make sure that everybody is sincere to the group, to the gang. This followed, this is followed by a long list of restrictions and prescriptions and is thus a miming of the very same civilizing code of behavior against which Huck and Tom are determined to evade. Yeah, they evaded, they escaped being civilized. In chapter one, you can see that Huck is told how to sit down on the table, how to, to have and eat his food. And when he asks to smoke, he is not allowed to smoke because that, this is not a civilized behavior. Now, these are rules for you to be part of the society, of the so-called civilized society at the moment. And in order to ridicule the idea of civilized, Mark Twain uses the S instead of the C, civilize, saying that even Huck, he doesn't himself understand, he doesn't know, he doesn't want to know how civilized is written, okay? But because they now forming a group, the group involves restrictions, involves rules, okay? And prescriptions here, they fall back into the idea of having rules and they already escaped from the life of rules. You see the point, how contradictory this is. It swore every boy to stick to the band and nobody that didn't belong to the band could use that mark. And if he did, he must be sued, luck. Rules, back to rules. They will take him to the court. And if he done it, okay? If he done it, if he done it, this is grammatical mistake that is done in purpose by Mark Twain, okay? Because he wants to mimic the society through the language of the boys. Again, he must be killed. If the person insists to use this mark, that doesn't belong to him and belongs to the band, then he is going to be sued. And if he doesn't abide, he will be killed. Of course, they are not going to kill anybody, but this is the culture of kids, okay? <coughs> Thus, Huck and Tom are invoking the very same societal means of rendering justice to those who violate its laws in the civilized and hypocritical world 
of decency and 25 self-righteousness and, and self-righteousness. You don't need this. It is one of the numerous frightening scenes replete with danger, violence, and the criminal behavior, which is at the same time mitigated by the fact that it is merely an expression of childish fantasy and twins humor and social satire. Yeah, these kids opt for these designs in order to evade the society that wants to restrict their move, movement. <laughs> the gang of robbers soon disbands. Yeah, it's just a band of child, of children. It disconnects. It's no longer exist, existent. The gang of robbers soon disbands after little Tommy Barnes, who has fallen asleep, is awakened, scared, and crying for his mother. Yeah, he's part of the band. But again, he's weak, he's child, he's fragile, and he sleeps, and then he awoke or awakes, frightened and crying for his mother. When the gang makes fun of Tommy, he threatens to reveal their conspiracy and earns five cents hush money. Hush money is an American term meaning to give money to somebody in order to silence them. Hush money is a word that is frequent in the American media nowadays. From which, from Tom Sawyer, who said, we would all go home and meet next week and drop somebody and kill some people. Of course they would. They are not going to come. They are not going to kill anybody. They are not going to rob. These are big words delivered by small kids. <coughs> This scene becomes one of the many instances in which Mark Twain's searing social commentary, searing, serious, okay? Social commentary is conveyed through the vehicle of his young protagonist, Tom and Huck, for despite their imaginative undertakings, the real world of social injustice and adult ficklessness, ficklessness here with un and uh, feckless is worthless, okay? Is forever impinging on their happiness. Yeah. When you say that the fecklessness of the society and the injustice impinging on these kids' happiness, this means that you talk about uh, Huckleberry Finn's daddy who is chasing him up for the money, the $6,000 he earned before, uh, and Miss Douglas, who wants to impose on him certain rules that uh, restricts his movement. The following morning, Huck receives a sermon from the widow Douglas. Yeah, she reproaches him because of his grimy clothes. She wants, to, she wants him to be well-dressed. Now, these are words from chapter 2. Okay, it's good to have a look at them, and I leave the book with the thesaurus for you, but I want you to focus on these words. Chapter 3. <coughs> Widow Douglas, the one who adopted Huckleberry Finn, okay, is a good-hearted widow, and she is a widow of a judge, by the way. Okay, Judge Douglas. So you can see three judges in the novel here. Judge Douglas, who's dead and whose widow is taking care of uh, Huckleberry Finn. And Judge Thatcher, who is the guardian of Huckleberry Finn's money. And the judge who takes care of the persecution of Pap Finn, the father of Huck, when he... Uh, tries to take the money by court from Huck. Now, the widow has a good heart, and instead of scolding Tom, she encourages, she doesn't scorn him, she doesn't ridicule him, okay? She encourages him to pray, 
but to little avail, she cannot succeed to convince him prey. Why? Why would the Douglas fails? Why does she fail to convince Huck to pray? Has not seen any concrete proof of its effectiveness. This is a manifestation of how Mark Twain did not in his time believe in the religious institution uh, or the religious tradition, okay? He doesn't pray because he doesn't believe that this prayer is answered. I says to myself, if a body can get anything they pray for, why don't Deacon Wen get back the money he lost on pork? If people are answered for their prayers, why Deacon Wen did not get back his money after he prayed for it. Yes, it's a simple, but it's deep. It's a humorous, but it is serious at the same time. What is so poignant at this early stage in the narrative is that Huck has a low opinion of himself. Yeah, he asks, he raises questions, but he is not self-confident. He's a boy, believing that everyone he comes in contact with is better than him. I thought it all out and reckoned I would belong to the widow's providence. Without her assistance, he is lost. Though I couldn't make out how he was going to be any better off then, than what he was before, seeing I was so ignorant and so kind of low down and ordinary. Ordinary troublemaker, somebody who doesn't believe in social system. Okay? <laughs> ordinary, you can translate ordinary into sa'ab al-miras. Huck's feelings of inferiority extend as far as Tom Sawyer, whom he perceives as superior because Tom reads books and attends school. Remember that due to Bab Finn's upbringing of Huck, Huck didn't go to school, okay? We also now learn a little bit about Bab Finn's legendary history as he relates that a body was found floating in the river, which some people believe to be Bab, though Huck considers him to be alive and dangerous. Imagine how a person, how a child believes that his dad is not dead and he will still pose risk in his life. I want you to take care of these words. Tearing, ferocious, bolts, music. Okay? Main, these words are mainly Midwest words. Midwestern American linguistic repertoire. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 begins with Huck revealing that though he is not overjoyed with school or with living in a house, he does not hate it the way he used to. Now, his uh, point of view changes. Huck is also equally as vulnerable to superstition as Jim. Vulnerable? He can believe in superstition. He can believe in, 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 in the unseen, the witches as seen by his behavior when he knocks over the salt shaker at the breakfast table. I would like you to go and see this on, on video, okay, in order to try and at least absorb what this means, <coughs> the idea of uh, salt, salt shaker, okay? I reached for some of it as quick as I could, he says, to throw over my shoulder and keep off the bad luck. Mm. Unfortunately, lending credence to this myth is the coincident fact that Huck then goes outside only to find boot prints in the snow. These are his 
daddy, an unmistakable sign that his father has been around. It's like bad omen. Recognizing that his father has designs on his money, designs, yeah, like deliberations, like uh, intentions, Huck instinctively runs to Judge Thatcher and begs him to act as trustee of the $6,000. Where did Huck gain these $6,000? At the time, $6,000 is a huge amount of money. I want you to go and look for this instance in the novel and elaborate on it. Try to understand <coughs> how they got the money and whether there is a connection between robbing this money or taking this money from illegal sources and legitimizing them afterwards. They are deposited with a judge, the symbol of justice. Why Judge Thatcher, okay, why didn't Judge Thatcher ask Huck about the source of this money? Think. Though the judge does not understand Huck's motives, he buys the account from Huck for one dollar, Huck's motive is to tell the truth to his father, mainly that he has no money. After leaving the judge, Huck decides to visit Jim, who possesses a hair ball, supposedly coming from the stomach of an ox, which can predict the future. Back to superstition, okay? Stomach of ox, hair ball, okay? Predicting future. And they play all these predicting future without predicting anything, eventually. Huck wants to divine Pap's plans, but Jim ends up predicting so many things that he actually predicts nothing. And indeed, the unrelenting fact that adults forever disrupt childhood happiness and well-being is manifested when Huck comes home to find his alcoholic father waiting for him. Yeah, this is a very serious scene where Huck is frightened by the presence of his father in the room. This is the, the thesaurus. Thank you for today. We're going to continue with chapter five, next class, class um, 15. Uh, please stay tuned. Thank you very much. Please make sure that you go throughout the thesaurus. I'll, I will leave the whole book for you today on Moodle. But make sure that you understand uh, these words like no, how, in no way, not at all, no way. Fortune, estate, fate, okay? <coughs> and so on and so forth. These are the things I want you to take care of. Now I will stop for a break and then continue class 15 afterwards. Thank you.